Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just decolonize you. Thank you for tuning in to The Advocate. Welcome. Today my worry is the terrible state of insecurity and the need for urgency to reform the Nigerian police. Joyce here is calling for Nigeria to move past the current constitution and rewrite a new one. Hmm. According to Noam Spencer, mental health is not a destination, but a process. It's about how you drive and not where you're going. Comfort is speaking on the role of social media and our phones are playing in our mental health. And finally, <laughs> Raymond is asking a really interesting question. When are we going to sell Nigeria? How about Raymond? What did it happen now? <laughs> As always, your panelists are here to share ideas aimed at provoking thoughts with no old bad. Stay with us for your Sunday dose of reflection, laughter, and education after this break. Insecurity and the urgent need for police reform in Nigeria. It is an understatement to say that the state of insecurity in our nation is disturbing. Almost everyone knows someone who was recently robbed, kidnapped, or killed. The most fundamental term of our social contrast is security of life and property. Sadly, that can no longer be guaranteed in Nigeria, and things are getting worse. There is a complete state of war in the Northeast, kidnapping and banditry everywhere else, the unending and ever increasing farmer's elders crisis, armed robbery, the list is endless. A report by the Open Society Initiative for West Africa states that the number of small arms in the hands of civilian non-state actors nationwide is estimated at 6,145,000, whilst that of the armed forces and law enforcement agency collectively is about 586,600 firearms, representing about 8.71% of the total arms and firearms in circulation. This is antithetical to Max Weber's view that only state should lay claim to the monopoly of legitimate physical violence within a certain territories. In our case, the people with access to resources to cause violence are in the frightening majority. It cannot be overemphasized that our security system is in a sorry state. That is also the state of our police. A visit to any police division and police barracks will convince you. Currently, our police lack the requisite support, adequate remuneration, equipment, and training to effectively carry out this enormous task. Prior to the NSAS protest, a police recruit earns 9,000 Naira per month. This is a violation of the Minimum Wage Act. The basic salary of a commissioner of police is about 260,000 per month, and a corporal earns 51,000 Naira per month and we wonder where our problems are emanate from. Well, I will suggest some reforms, and you can add yours. Restructure the Nigerian police force, strengthen local police force, and induce constitutional amendment to allow state government to establish state or community police for the purpose of crime prevention, detection, and prosecution within their jurisdictions. The welfare of the Nigerian police should be immediately addressed by ensuring better conditions of service, better remuneration, housing, and other benefits, 
I personally would suggest 200,000 Naira per month for an entry level officer. Some level of re-education should be considered for policemen and women's children. Health insurance schemes, life insurance, house mortgage schemes, amongst others. Entry level recruitment should not be below OND. And to ensure that police training meets international standards, the length of training should not be less than 18 months. Also, there should be provisions for continuous human capacity development for the Nigerian police to close the skill gaps amongst the personnel. <laughs> There's a need for periodic psychological evaluation for every police person during recruitment and throughout their service years. The government needs to provide modern equipment to combat crimes and design a system for equipment financing for the police on an ongoing basis and ensure deployment of technology for crime detection, investigation, and prevention. Develop an anti-corruption enforcement framework for the Nigerian police force to tackle issues of commercialization of bail, the nuisance of roadblocks, the unceasing harassment, amongst others. Only a safe environment will guarantee economic development and good life that we all desire. We must reform the Nigerian police, and we need to do so now. Very interesting, the numbers <coughs> that you've raised. I totally agree with the reforms. Asking for 200,000 at entry level is also workable. It would just take us to also check the earning capacity of the country mm. and the distribution capacity. Are we going to talk about the news of the 60 billion that has to be printed to get monies into the system? But if we can get it right, I think we will have the police force that we seek. Well, I think I substantially agree with uh, Francis. I mean, it couldn't have been even better put. Um, of course, by the Constitution, uh, Section 14, Subsection 2B is very clear that the security and the welfare of the people, of course, is, the, is at the heart of the social contract between the citizens and the government. And when that is broken, then you have a recipe for anarchy. And it's not surprising that there's a relationship between the breakdown of security at large and the wobbling state of the Nigerian state, but in terms of economy and what have you. Because if we have a strong security infrastructure, to a large extent, we wouldn't have the rising speed of kidnappings, insurgency and in the southeast and all of that. All of this, all of this aggregate to create a shock for the system, you understand? Mm -hmm. So if we had a better security system in place, we don't have the right, the upsurge in insurgency. The monies we are spending funding the insurgency wars would have committed it to other development aspects of the nation. So security is actually instructive, and we really have to get it right. And I agree with most of your recommendations. As a matter of fact, after the, um, in the wake of the NSAS protest, I was privileged to work with the office of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And the question was, how do we what can we do to create to get a legal framework that will improve the, 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 the current police structure we there have? There is none. In terms, of, in terms of the welfare of the, mem of the rank and file, you understand? So we looked at the Police Service Commission um, Act, which was passed in, two, in 2000. So we have redrafted it, and we've made, uh, to, I'm very surprised that all your recommendations actually form part of what you recommended in that bill. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to announce that it has passed second reading on the floor of both House of National Assembly, and we are hopeful that if it eventually gets signed into law, the, these things can begin to be addressed. But certainly, we can't uh, compromise security. Yeah. Comfort, let's hear your view. It, yes, uh, thank you. Not taking away from what, um, you know, what you read, what you said, um, what befundles me is the fact that we have to say this all the time. This is not the first time that, you know, people have, you know, put this clearly. I mean, if you had even just stopped at the need for police reforms, you would have, I mean, you would have been 100% without even breaking it down. Because without breaking it down, can't they see, can't the government see that this is what is needed. I mean, if you're going to take the history of even insurgency, we're talking about at least 10 years. You mean in those 10 years, 
Nobody thought it fit that the National Assembly, the government itself, should have taken this without us every single opportunity we get laying it out. So, yes, I mean, fantastic and all that. I'm happy to hear what you said, that um, you were part of a committee and that finally they have seen the need to put... Uh, I, I mean, I'm not impressed um, because... I mean, I'm really not impressed unless we need to have a bill to remind them every time that, please, when you see things going wrong, go, can you put yourself into our shoes and please make sure that these things go ahead? So, I mean, kudos. Anyway, at least for what it is worth, hope alive. There's something. I just pray that the people who are there are human beings so that they'll be able to implement these things because this is so long overdue. The statistics you even wrote, I mean, is shocking. It's yeah. appalling. It shouldn't even be something that should be printed for us to see because, I, I mean, I, I mean, that's all I have to say, to be honest. It's annoying. I was going to, uh, you know, in recent times, we've seen regional, you know, the, uh, the debate on state police has always been with us, yes. at least since the Fourth Republic. Yes. And it appears mm -hmm. we are, perforce, we are inching towards state police, even though not uh, uh, in a clear legal sense of it. You understand? Uh, we mm. saw the southwestern uh, oh, states, they have come up with the Amotekun. If you ask me that is regional police, that is state police, yeah. even if maybe uh, I will yeah, call I it de facto, yeah. de facto state police in play. Mm. Now, because of what's happened in the southeast, we now have the Ebibagu, mm. the glory of the tiger mm. in play. You understand? Yeah. So. States are now taking, taking charge. They are, they, are, they are taking charge because the federal government uh, doesn't seem to. They, at the end of the day, they are the chief security officers of their state, at least in principle. Mm. And I think uh, we we we, we just hope that done. we just hope that they actually get the, the objective for which this outfits are set up are actually being uh, actualized. I, 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 I agree with you and comfort. The only fear is that there is no uniform legal framework for the states to run this system that they, they have started practicing. Yes. And that can create some fears. But the fear of a thing should not discourage us from oh, practicing man. it or trying right. it. Exactly. And exactly. to close with comfort statement that we've been saying this for the umpteen time, there is a problem in my, there's a proverb in my place mm -hmm. that says woro woro la difadity, that the deaf person, mm -hmm. by the time you are throwing the incantation to the ifa, you continue to do it repeatedly. Yes. And the deaf, even if you cannot hear you, will make a we'll sense of it. what you are saying. Oh, okay. Thank Repetition you. is the law of deep and lasting impression. We're just not relenting, right? Yeah. We keep interesting. going. We keep going until we get. Next is Joyce, talking about the need for a new constitution. Stay with us. <laughs> A new constitution. Nigeria is currently using the constitution as enacted in May 1999, having used five others previously. One, in the colonial era, 1914 to 1960, we had Clifford of 1922, Richard of 1946, Macpherson of 1951, and Littleton of 1954. Two, the independence constitution of 1960. Three, the 1963 Constitution of the First Republic. Four, the 1979 Constitution of the Second Republic. Five, the 1993 Constitution of the Third Republic. In the Fourth Republic, the present 1999 Constitution. Now, there are a lot of reasons why the current Constitution needs to be trashed. But today, allow me to stick with only two reasons. Number one is the preamble to the Constitution which gives the impression that the Constitution is the work of Nigerians when it claims that we, the people of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, having firmly and solemnly resolved, do hereby make, enact, and give to ourselves the following Constitution. This is just not true. As the ordinary Nigerians were neither consulted in the preparation of the Constitution, nor was the Constitution written by us. Therefore, a constitution not written by us cannot work for us. Number two, the process of drafting the constitution itself was quite defective. There was inadequate consultation with Nigerians. There was no constitutional conference or no constitutional conferences to ascertain the wishes and desires of Nigerians. Nor were referendums conducted to confirm whether or not the constitution was acceptable to and by the people. So how would a constitution be fitting enough when it is not conceived 
with the diversity of Nigeria in mind. How can a constitution that isn't sensitive to the circumstances of the Nigerian terrain ensure its sustenance and productivity? It will seem that one major reason why we haven't made significant progress in burying this dead horse of a constitution is because we have become so used to it. It is, prob it is probably beneficial to a select few, and they have therefore devised means to profit off of its misgivings. But as long as this retrogressive status quo is maintained, they will continue to weave their way. There is no shame in burying a dead horse that doesn't work for Nigeria anymore. The horse's lifespan serves as enacted experience, a guide to making better choices in the future. So what are the steps to rewriting the Constitution? Referendum. Representatives at the legislature should be tasked with meeting their constituents and detailing their every desire for what the Constitution should and can look like. These meetings can span months. All points must then be properly documented in the most transparent and painstaking manner possible. Constitutional Convention. These same representatives and other stakeholders will then publicly meet and debate on what should be contained in the Constitution. Every representative must be allowed free speech, just like in the Constitutional Convention assembled in Philadelphia in May of 1787. Then we have the documentation process. After debates have been properly weighed and analysis derived, decisions should be put in writing by a committee and then compressed. All parties would then sign an agreement if and when the document satisfies the needs of their constituents. Final step would be the approval and implementation of said new constitution. I think Raymond should go first. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't have interest in selling the country. I don't think I have too much interest. Our constitutional in lawyer, please now. Please. But if I might just, um, since uh, the gun has been thrown at me, um, of course I read the scripts and um, you know, the argument on the, on the Nigeria constitution is an, an argument that may never end. It has been with us as long as we've had this country. In recent times, um, it has, the, the, we hear persons advocate of a new constitution uh, seems to be high in the pro. And the argument is this, that the constitution is not homemade. That is, some people call it a decree and all what it have you. It is written uh, as a decree. Yes, and they are saying that we should have a new constitution that's actually, that, that represents the independent will of Nigerians at large. And while I'm not taking away anything from the argument of those of, that, that are in that school of thought, my view, I'm of the school of thought that, um, that argues that the constitution, there is no constitution that is a perfect document anywhere in the world. And that's why we say that constitutions are, organic documents. They continue to grow with changing realities and society continues to evolve. And that's why constitutions usually have the process of amending its provisions to catch up with the realities of the modern times. Now, if for any reason the argument is that this constitution is not working, I think the argument should be how do we get it work? Section 9 of the constitution has provided elaborate means of amending its constitution. And to a large extent, I think we have explored this option. We have up to four, or four alterations to the 1999 Constitution, uh, with each of them focused on tackling specific um, issues. So for me, the problem is not so much of the source of the, the, pro, the, 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 source of the Constitution, as much as it is the enforcement of the, cons, of, the, of the Constitution itself. And I gave an example of the current strike action by the judicial staff workers. What is the issue? They are advocating for autonomy for state judiciaries. Now, section 121, subsection 3 of the Constitution guarantees the autonomy for state judiciaries. Why aren't the state governors enforcing, enforcing it? So I don't think we should put so much blame on, we should interrogate the process with the people. Did all Nigerians come and gather at TBS and say, okay, put your signature, we have signed, Constitution, <laughs> take it. That's not the problem. I think we should focus more on enforcing the letters of letters of what you have. If there's a need for changing, 
that we amend the Constitution, Constitution section 9 of the Constitution. Uh, what say you, Francis? Uh, my, my, my own view <clears throat> uh, is that we need to revise the Constitution, just like Raymond suggested, and to, to hold the brief of the people who gave us this Constitution. That was a process. Number one is that this condition is a photocopy of the 1979 constitution. There's a rule in law that once a document has been satisfied, it doesn't require further certification. So if you have a constitution, 1979 constitution, that went through the drafting committee of 49 members and 230 member constituents assembly that looked at it and adopted it before they presented it to the nation. So why go through the same process again? It was 40 years ago that was, so much has changed in 40 years. The American years. constitution was written in 1787. Over 200 years, they have deployed amendments. What yes. they call the what do they call it now? I'm not an American. Amendment. They call it amendment. I'm, I'm, you understand? I'm Nigerian. So so, so <laughs> I don't so have to a, wait until they write so, a so, new constitution so and I say, okay, well, Americans have done it. Here. The, the truth of the matter is certain things might have changed, certain things still remain. The reality of 2019 is not the reality of 2021. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus has redefined the yes. world. So so and then also to further argue in support of the people who gave us that law. The fact that they photocopied the one that went through the processes that you suggested mm -hmm. yeah. made it less necessary to go through that process to again. That is why. The then two, if it, it, what brought us to the democracy we got with blood, tears, and sweat in 1999, between 1998, June, and May 1999, when Abacha died, did not leave room for too much debate. Exactly. What we wanted as a country is the military out. Exactly. We, we felt that once the military are out, we will we'll find a way of resolving our issues. And, and that did not allow going through, because there are a lot of things that divide us as a nation, yeah. more than the things that unite us. Sure. So if you go to those assemblies, there might be focus so much more on the things that divide us. Mm, why the military, why the military and, and let us just move to the next stage. Now, it is the next stage that we are, it has not given us the opportunity for you to suggest that we should amend or review or revise the Constitution. Exactly. Truth be told, if we want to amend the Constitution, we will we go through this thing. Comfort, let's, 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 let's hear your view. Um, yes, yeah, so the Constitution, the amendment of the Constitution is another uh, topical issue. And um, I think I'm with uh, Joyce on this. Uh, but I think my view would be be on the, for me, uh, on clarity of what the constitution seeks to convey. Um, we've had the issue of, you know, on one hand, we say we're a secular country and we base it on the constitution. On the other hand, we have, um, you know, re the religious part of it, you know, and the traditional part all lumped up in the same constitution, which for me is what creates the unbalance, um, the imbalance and um, the, a lot of the problems that we're having. As she said, a lot of things have happened and gone through in our nation, but I think it is also the people who put the constitution together that probably just were not up to scratch. Um, you alluded to um, the, the American constitution and we've seen it's over 200 years old. Why has it endured? It has endured because the people who sat down to write that constitution wrote it not from selfish interest. They wrote it in the interest of everybody who couldn't be at our own in the figure in the figurative and in, in, in Tinubu Square. They wrote it that if I if I'm not here, would the next person be able to use this constitution, find justice, find fairness? find um, legal standing, and those are the things that are missing in our constitution. And on that premise for me, yes, we do need a new one. We now need selfless people who understand that it is not about me, but about my the next generation coming and the next generations coming that this constitution needs to be written for. And the first point for me is that it has to be clear. It has to be homogeneous. Are we a secular nation following a, a straight path of justice, fairness, or whatever, or are we a religious one that is following the dictates of uh, um, God that um, um, satisfies everybody. Over. Um, Thank well, you well, so um, much. So it <laughs> comes down to that same issue. This argument may never end because of it has to do with mm. the constitution. Mm. Well, you see, I keep asking myself, 
what is it that will be written in this new constitution that will be totally different from what is contained in the current document? Some things that for example, will be written. Uh, for example, Comfort made argument that the constitution should be based on principle of equality, justice, and fairness. When you go to the chapter two of the constitution, it gives an in, an idea of what this of Social and the justice. idea of the constitution. It doesn't it? So it still comes down to the issue of the enforcement. So should we amend the constitution to say that chapter two should now be justiceable? Yes. Yes. If that is the case, yes. then we have to write it. Yes. So, so, so. Uh, May I, mean, I come I in get, here get so that point. I can get that case? I, 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 I guess Raymond's be, point. Mm -hmm. Raymond is in favor of amendment and improving on the constitution as it were, mm. instead of writing one. Well, and there is no, there will be, we will not be acting on any legal basis if we are writing another one because the constitution that guides everything that we ought to do makes provision for amendment yes. and not the writing. Yes. So we will be acting outside the chief law of the land by saying we want to rewrite. If it will only satisfy the itch of Nigerians who are alive now, then it's good enough reason. If we feel like we own the constitution and we commit ownership, then wouldn't it be worth it? So this is where I come in. Raymond. Yes. Uh, Sorry, I just wanted to um, answer what he said when he said the chapter two, and that was why I referred to the fact that it is unclear the type of constitution we're operating. If you have half of the country saying that their law is Sharia law, for example, and I do not subscribe, I'm not an adherent of Sharia law, how does chapter two help me when my rights get violated? Because there is an entrenched, it's, it's the Sharia is entrenched in the constitution, which still has this chapter two, that but then the, the Sharia itself is a law. And so because of that unclarity and that clash, there, you cannot have an equitable constitution. It's not possible. You so, must so. be clear on what oh. you are doing. Come are on. you secular and all of us are on one, on one foundation so that if you violate my laws, I can go to so one course. source and get my redemption. Comfort, if I may, I, I would defer to, to, to Raymond, who seems to have a PhD in constitutional law. But <laughs> uh, uh, my, my, my view is, you see, Sharia law in Nigeria that is enshrined in the constitution is treated as customary law, and it is Sharia private law. Now, if you have issues with people and it has to relate with uh, the criminal part of Sharia law, that is not what our constitution speaks to. What does our constitution speak to? Our what is constitution the speaks to private law. Isn't that the clarity that the comes practice? about? That it, this is is clear. Clear. it is clear in the constitution <laughs> that we have now. It's only for you to find it. Islamic personal so, law. So it is the Islamic personal law, and it is treated as customary law. Yeah. And our customary law, our, our customary law is also recognized. Also mm -hmm. And that is why yes, you have the Sharia Court of Appeal, yes. and then you have the customary Court, court of Appeal in our constitution. Exactly. And, and, and so... We, the, the clarity is there. Is so there. if we treat the Sharia, so it's, it is not much, even if that is sourced from the religion, mm -hmm. it, is, it is more of a customary law yes. under our laws. Now, and, and the, 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 uh, it is not so difficult to understand what it is, particularly if you look deeper into what we have as against what is being painted. That is one. What yeah. is being painted? How? What is being painted is that Sharia law is operating somewhere and it's uh, to enable some people to trample on other people's rights using Sharia law, prosecuting people yeah. using Sharia law. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. That is not the law. That is not what our constitution says as of today. Yes. So when you have laws in certain states that yes. says you must not take alcohol, it is the law of that state. It is not the, the constitution that allows an isba to come and break your bottle of beer. I've stopped drinking beer. So I uh, have... <laughs> and that aligns with the principle of federalism that allows states, states to be to autonomous make... and independent and make their own private laws. So... Um... But that's not part of what we have now. Is that what we're operating? You're still going back to what I'm saying. You, you have just spoken Clarity. about federalism, but we, it's not Clarity. what we are practicing. Is it the, reg the reg um, regionalization? No, Let in, every state do what it wants to do. So, so in that case so, of the and that's I'm saying that the missing link the is the enforcement that any um, state infrastructure that is missing, and which I think we should, amendment of the constitution should be, uh, effort should be made in amending the constitution to meet up with the, the, the missing link that has to do with its enforcement. So, 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 so the truth of the matter is, when he no brought up the law. issue of his bar and breaking of bottles, Comfort. right, 
And comfort. you said it's related comfort. to only the state. Okay. Yes, the, the, there's no perfect law. Yes. And who would have thought that the American law as it relates to transition from one government to the other was that weak until we the advent of uh, Donald Trump? Okay, Francis, the conversations will continue and they will never be complete without you. Temilade Amulodun says, I like your talk show. Very interactive and insightful. Thank you, Advocate Team. So follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, using the hashtag TheAdvocateNG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, using the hashtag TheAdvocateNG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to PlusTVAfrica.com forward slash TheAdvocateNG. Comfort is talking to us on the effect of social media on our mental health after this break. Phones, the internet, social media, and our mental health. According to Statista.com, there are about 185 million mobile subscribers, but only between 25 to 40 million users in Nigeria. The revolution in the telecommunications industry saw an explosion of especially smartphones usage as we move from an era of multiplicity of functions to a time now where we virtually have everything at the touch of a button or a swipe. With this newfound world, our lives became easier, more interesting, exposed, and informed. However, this also came at a cost, a cost that we are not focusing on and its impact on our future. It is no longer uncommon to see children as young as five years old with a phone. Most parents justify giving phones to their children to keep them entertained, while others feel it is the right time and justify the position from the angle of security. Well, while there can be something said for the ease and opportunities that phones have brought us, it is time we look at the flip side of the phone and access to the internet in our lives. Everything in life that is good has a potential to be bad if it is abused and lacking in discipline. The dangers of the use of mobile phones and the internet are not being discussed enough. It distracts older children from their studies and chores, makes them complete, complete exam malpractice, spend excessive time on their mobiles and exposes them to bad movies, pornography, online grooming, meeting strangers and negative role modeling. The truth is that adults are just as vulnerable. In a fast-paced world with parents occupied with the rat race, they are not often there as the gatekeepers and guardians of these children. There seems to be a paucity of an apathy towards social media studies as it relates to children in Nigeria. Researchers have suggested that problematic phone use should be classified as a behavioral addiction. In 2020, Netflix released a documentary called Social Dilemma a docudrama film that goes into depth on how social media's design is meant to nurture an addiction. The film also examines the serious issue of social media's effect on mental health, including the mental health of adolescents and rising teen suicide rates. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs raised their children tech-free, and that should have been a red flag that the two biggest tech figures in recent history seldom let their children play with the very products they helped create. In 2007, Gates, the former CEO of Microsoft, implemented a cap on screen time when their daughter developed an unhealthy attachment to a video game. He also did not let his children get cell phones till they turned 14. Jobs until his death in 2012 revealed in a 2011 New York Times interview that he prohibited his kids from using the newly released iPad. Chris Anderson, co-founder of drone manufacturer 3D Robotics, in an interview said that his children accused him of being overly concerned about technology. He said, and I quote, that's because we've seen the dangers of technology firsthand. I've seen it in myself. I don't want to see that happen to my kids. If wealthy Silicon Valley parents seem to grasp the addictive powers of smartphones, tablets, and computers more than the public does. Though these parents often make a living by creating and investing in that technology. Shouldn't we sit up? We Over must to the sit floor. up. <laughs> we must sit up. 
My son is going to be 19 this year. He was not allowed to have a phone until last year when he turned 18. That was when he got his first official phone. Before then, he had to use mom's phone. Because the moment I heard that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates had such cap yes. on the time that the children were exposed, I said, eh, you've seen me now. So my darling son, a cap on it for you as well. And even now, we try, we try, we try to to regulate the use. We try, that's the underlined word, because it's becoming increasingly difficult. Classes are held on Zoom. Schedules with your, 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 your coaches are held online. Almost everything is there. You want to send me a message, you, you're sending me a link to look at this, the, the, the story you're trying to get me to see. You're trying to send me, you want me to be on the same page as you, you're sending me internet links so that I read keeping us there further. So we continue to try. I think we must be wiser, especially about our yeah. children and holding yeah. ourselves to higher standards. Nobody will die. The world won't fall if my phone is dropped for 10 hours a day. The fear of missing mm. out keeps us hanging on constantly. And of mm. course, that adrenaline rush that says, oh, somebody just liked, that's there. But that fear of missing out, what if my client calls? What if my boss calls? What if my associates need my help? Nobody will die. No sky will fall. I'm dropping my phone today. It's something I personally started doing this year intentionally. Yeah. Every yeah. month, I have a day off completely. I actually have two days off where somebody takes all my phones and laptops away for two full days. Once it cleanses my mind, it helps me bring back the jitters to say, ha, Joyce, nothing will die. Nothing will stop. You have to put your life in order, else you'll completely be out of control, like any other addicts that you might look down on on the street. Their addiction yeah. is cocaine. Mine is my phone. There's no difference. True. True. Mm. So we must hold ourselves to higher account. Higher Francis. Ah, that's deep from Joyce. I, mm. I am a village man, so the, the phone addiction scene is, um, doesn't really uh, 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 relate with me that deeply. Because I can do without it. Ah, wonderful. The, uh, uh, la, 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 One in a last million. year, the doctors advised after a procedure that my phone be taken away. I didn't miss it. And mm. uh, when the phone came back, no I eat phone calls. Mm. Uh, uh, so when the phone came back, oh. it was a lot of stress. Now, on the social media side of things, I, it, uh, it's a jungle. I, 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 I am better able, the limited time I spend on social media, I'm better able to manage my interaction after reading a book from Ryan Holiday, he called it, Ego is the Enemy. And what you see playing out on social media, is just feeding to people's egos and not solving any problem. You hardly see, even among the biggest influencers, people coming out to profile solutions. It's just about the number of likes, the number of retweets and all that. And people go into depression when they don't, get they don't get that. You could see the, the kind of impact on people's mental state when they say Twitter takes away their undo or suspends mm -hmm. yeah. them or this or that. Mm -hmm. But there is the other very heavy part for those of us who run our businesses on social media. Yeah. Mm. The, the quality of videos and content I put out determines how people buy my products and feed me, in quote. Mm -hmm. I don't have an office. My office is my phone. Social media is the meeting room for myself the and market. my team. That's our market. Our office is on a, a, an app called Slack. That's where we clock in every day. We put in the duties for the day and we take off our schedules. Phone, once again. Sure. We run offices. How was I found for the advocate? Tell us. Social media. <laughs> I put up a video where I talked about the refineries. Yeah. And it was like, oh, this person sounds like somebody who should be part of the advocate. From social media, that's where I work. You wouldn't so, know so, me so, besides so that. Is, that. So, so for, that's for, for, just striking like the balance. Just like Comfort said, for everything that has an advantage, there, there is, is a disadvantage. Yes. You can switch yes. off, you can lock your door, switch off your eye, pressing iron if you forgot it at home from your phone and all that. So there are advantages to it. Mm. So, but the, the, the other side of it is the, the, the mental... Excess. So, sometimes it's not even the essence, but the quality of information that you take from social media oh, yes. and allow Correct. to impact oh, your yes. life and mental state is another thing. Yeah. And, and so, just like you said, maintain a balance and also watch what you consume. Mm -hmm. There are certain mm -hmm. information that are not good for you. There are certain interactions mm -hmm. that you should not get yourself involved mm -hmm. in. So if you're not going to create solutions, put food on your table, just like you said, 
There's no point. Why do I argue with you just because I want to be right? I don't have to be right. Move on. Exactly. Uh, well, for me, yeah, uh, comfort. If what you just mm. read out, if that was script was a chat sheet, then I think I should be pleading guilty as charged. Then you are guilty. Because <laughs> I'm taking your phone. <laughs> because like when you read when when you, when I read your script, it was it was a reflection of my my personal struggle. You understand? Wow. But it's because of the nature of work we do and how someone has made has been able to make himself resourceful. You understand? At every point in time, people are calling you, do this, do that. You have so much to read in a day to keep up with. I write a column for an online, uh, an, a Nigerian online platform. I have to keep up with the, with the key issues. Yes. You understand? I have to research far into other jurisdiction so I can be able to um, uh, formulate my own viewpoint on an issue. So you, you can't switch off. It's unfortunate that the times we live, life has gone completely e or virtual. So I, I don't know how we can how we can manage it. But as you pointed out, there should always be a, a need for more. I can profess some solutions. Okay. Things that I'm working on myself. Am okay. I allowed to? Please. Number one is yes, to get please. help. Okay. There are people that we call assistants, executive assistants, mm -hmm. uh, virtual assistants, whatnot. I have that that guys right. Now, <laughs> now it will shock you, but especially because of COVID, some people will work with you for paltry sums as little as 20,000 naira because okay. without your 20,000 naira, they have no other income. Guess what? They are already good at researching and they research for life. It's their meat, it's their bread, it's their water. Okay. So you tell them, I want to get information on this, that, 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 that. And you don't work with them every day. You yeah. work with them three to yeah. four times a week, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. And guess what? That's what is called the gig economy. Yeah. They research for you, they research for me, they research for you. Yeah. By the time we all pay them 20,000 naira each, they're making 60,000, but they're working for us. Exactly. And then we, we expand their reach. So exactly. you get help. Okay. Okay. Um, the accountant point. looked at my in income and said, we can take from your income and hire other people to help you okay. to come up with your script. So for the script for today, for example, I had all the thoughts in my head. I sent a nine-minute voice note to someone okay. who is this assistant and okay. said, these are my thoughts. Okay. Flesh it out and send it back to me. That has saved me time. That has Beautiful. saved me spending six hours on the internet. Then I can put up my phone for a moment just to rest my eyes. You Even see. if it's just my eyes, wearing yeah, glasses that yeah, are anti-glare yeah, yeah, and all of that. So yeah. we look for help. We're, okay, we're constantly okay. trying to find help. Sure, Other sure. thing is, if I remember that I'm so resourceful that the people who need me are willing to work at my time, mm -hmm. that takes courage and confidence to ask, sure. to say, can I submit on Friday? Okay. You are saying a Tuesday deadline. I am saying I can meet you on Friday. Friday. Choose. Okay. And sometimes they take a step back and say, we need Raymond. Mm -hmm. Let's wait till Friday. They give you time okay. to, okay. to rest. Okay. Yeah. It's work in progress, and I think Actually, we'll get there. Actually, it's a serious issue. The last time I traveled, I saw my parents. I was so happy for them. I was so happy because I saw the state they were. My dad had his transistor radio by the side <laughs> doing some jingles. There was no pressure. There was no rush to know what is, There was no likes. They don't know what is happening. They are just at peace. So I tried to see... How can I actually um, mirror my life I, 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 I like theirs? But uh, unfortunately, I may not be able to do it. I will I'm invite living, you on my I next... I different time with, with, with I will them. invite you on my next technology fast day. Maybe okay. we'll fast I, I would, together. I would, I would welcome that then. I would welcome Comfort, that. thank you so much for making us talk about this. Yeah. I think Raymond is angry today because this question gets us to be. Raymond is asking us to sell this country after this break. I'm with him on it. When are we going to sell this country? Fellow Nigerians, things are really getting out of hand. But is this news anymore? I do not think so. You only need to have a chat with the average Nigerian out there to find out just how bad things have gone. But it appears we might have just unlocked a new level in our economic doldrums. A few days ago, the governor of Edo State, Godwin Obaseki, told us that a whopping 50 to 60 billion naira was minted by the federal government for the states to share in the monthly bazaar that best contextualizes the absurdity of our federalism. For the avoidance of doubt, what this means is that Nigeria has become so broke that there is not enough money to share owing to depleting federal revenue. Governor Baseki, as the governor of a state that participates in the monthly ritual, should know what he was talking about 
even if other governors may have chosen to be silent about it. The federal government has expectedly denied Governor Basaki's claims and asserted Nigeria's supposed decent financial standing. So who do we believe? Or Baseki or the mendacious federal government of Muhammad Buhari? Why the jury is still out on that, circumstantial evidence, however, seems to support Obaseki's claims, at least from our astronomic inflation numbers and other economic vitals. When a government takes the easy path of minting more money, it opens the economy to all manner of shocks and risks, including rising inflation and consequential rise in the prices of goods and services. The latest numbers from the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics as at February 2021 shows that Nigeria currently has an alarming inflation rate of 17.3%. We are currently the poverty capital of the world. Our unemployment numbers are scary with an unprecedented unemployment rate of 27%. I leave each and every one of us to speak for themselves on what has become the prices of commodities in the market. So is that a thing that is being hidden from Nigerians? As me for a moment that Governor Baseki was being unduly sensational with his claims, perhaps to score cheap political points as the federal government would have us believe, are we not actually heading towards that direction in actual fact? I read a disturbing piece the other day by the former CEO of the Defund Diamond Bank, Dr. Alex Oti, which put in alarming context our current dismal fiscal position, contrary to what the Minister of Finance would have us believe. A situation where we have borrowed up to our neck so that we now owe up to $85 billion and spend over 85% of our annual budget to service our national debt is indicative of a serious economic crisis that might set us on the Zimbabwe or Venezuelan path. So Governor Basaki is not the problem. The devil is in the details of our economy. I don't see myself as an incurable optimist. I think I'm more of a pragmatist or at best a cautiously optimistic fellow. And so if things have gotten so bad out of hand that we now have to print more money to run this economy, I don't think it is altogether out of place to join the choir of pessimists who have often argued that this country as a whole be put up for sale. How much are you looking for? <laughs> And, uh, and a big one at that, that he wants to sell Nigeria. The whole country. The whole of Nigeria. Uh, 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 the truth of the matter is you cannot uh, overemphasize the fact that Nigeria is broke. Mm. In fact, one OAP would always say Nigeria is bankrupt. Mm. And uh, whatever the glowing state of the economy that the government or the Minister of Finance wants to paint, there is a, there's a saying in my place, Tabakuri uh, Asunri. Meaning. That even if we haven't died, we've slept. So we 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 <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we know what is going on. Yeah. So we can tell whether the economy is gloomy or it's performing excellently. And the truth of the matter is, we know what we know. <laughs> just like the former governor of Lagos State said. See, the 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 economy is in a bad shape. And we run the most expensive, one of the most expensive governments in the world. In the world. Our National Assembly are about the most expensive in the world. Sure. And if you look at what we deploy to the National Assembly alone, alone, and how much more we can do with it by deploying to other sectors of the economy, you can begin to uh, imagine what we can achieve. Mm -hmm. We've held on to certain assets. So if you, maybe we commence by selling Nigeria, by selling those assets, those assets that have become cost centers, yes. why are we keeping to, why are we holding on That's to the refineries sure. that are cost centers? And then another one, whooping 1.2 billion era is 1. to, 1.5, 1.5, to mm. repair dollars, uh -huh. to repair Portacourt refinery. Mm -hmm. For 225 barrels per day only. We don't need that. Yeah. I, my, we, my question. So, 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 so this thing is paining me because... Yeah. We, we've spoken to this, even in the party that I belong, okay. that we have a board revenue plan. There are some, some, some entities that Nigeria owed equities yeah. that we can do without. We can yeah. sell them for good money sure. to address pressing needs sure. with long-term impact. And remember that at the end of the year, we still come and collect company income tax. Yeah. So let the government focus on the business of governance. Yeah. 
and providing regulation for companies to thrive yes. exactly. and creating the environment for businesses yes. to do well yes. as against government competing with yes. businessmen. Yes. Now, we have refineries. Dangote's refinery, whose capacity is even bigger than the whole of Nigerian refinery put together, they are going to be in competition very soon. Why do we need to do that? So the fact that we are broke, or uh, they want to sell Nigeria, they, let's not sell it as a whole. Let's uh, <laughs> sell the, 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 the part that we need to sell. <laughs> let's, sell the part. <laughs> let, let's sell the spare part. <laughs> and when I saw Raymond coming with a very big bag, I knew he had an agenda. <laughs> My question, Raymond, is if, if and when we sell the country, what do we become? Slaves or... No, we're going to buy another country. <laughs> oh, okay, we will not have enough money to buy another country. You see, to answer your question in a yeah. very funny manner, yeah. some people have argued that um, if you should take all of Nigerians to the U.S. and mm -hmm. ask all of them to come here, mm -hmm. in under five years, we'll be wanting to come back to Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah. So that tells yeah. the picture of what we are facing with. In fact, uh, one of my, my, my idols, Chino Achebe, said that the problem with Nigeria is not in the Nigerian air or in the Nigeria or her geography. It's simply and squarely a problem of leadership. Mm. It is a problem mm. of poor choices. Yeah. Nigeria is a proverbial, is a biblical prodigal son who has eaten up all the wealth of his nation and has now become broke. It and is doesn't not, have the humility to yes. admit that yeah, I'm now broke brokenness. and we need help to fix it. But they're saying, okay, no, we're still okay, exactly. we're still the best. I started living, still, a, living a false, false, a false reality and then make it, uh, and the reality on the street is that people are actually suffering. People are suffering. And why it pains me is because my generation is actually at the, at, the, at the receiving end of this. Our fathers had a better, they had a better experience than us. As a matter of fact, Chino Achebe described his generation as a lucky generation. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? But can we say the same thing for our generation? So that's why it, it, it gives me serious concern. Comfort. As I mean, I loved this topic. When are we going to sell in this country? I mean, the, 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 <laughs> the sooner we are honest about our issues, the better for us. But there will be no takers. Um, that's the problem because even the little thing, when you sell something, there should be some value in it, you know. And um, at this point, if anybody uh, um, take, uh, sells us, what do we have? Um, you know, quite frankly. And I think um, one of you mentioned that um, if we... If we if we did sell, what would we do with what would happen? You know what would happen to us, and the issue of leadership. There's also the issue of followership. These leaders come from among us. Each time we know we say the leaders, but who are the leaders? We are the ones who participate in what brings out these bad leaders. So when are we followers too going to be, begin to look at ourselves and tell ourselves that this country? is in the position it's in because I have also contributed to it by either selling my, my vote or not talking, speaking up when I should or not being consistent when I've seen something wrong, when I have broken the traffic light, even as simple, small, you know, things as, as, um, as little as that. Um, are we going to get to the point where we will be humble enough to tell, to say that um, we are broke? Maybe, but at that point, who cares? Everybody too has their own issue in their country. Sure. And Nigeria is always a country where either you have donor money coming in in millions, not in small figures. They give it to the government. They give it to the millions states. They, we squander it. We don't improve on what they've given us the money for. So you collect loans. You, you said we should even sell the money, if, um, sell the um, pieces, the spare parts. We will sell it. We will still squander the money. Yeah. So it's it's a vicious circle. And at this point, yeah. it's a catch-22. It so it my, my yeah. joy and and my hope as the unrepentant optimist is that we have us. <laughs> we have us. We have comfort. We have you. We have Francis. We have Joyce. And we have many other Nigerians <laughs> like us. For every one of us that has a good idea, there are 7,000 others who are like us but just may not be as outspoken as we are. Sure. When you go to an event and you ask for questions during the Q&A session, three hands will come up only. Yeah. But after those three, check it, 15 yeah. hands will yeah. come up. Yeah. Because our hands are up. Yes. Other people will raise their hands. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the hope, not hope for foolishness, but hope for energy sure. that we can still recover this country amongst us. Sure. We have the will. Sure. Or I don't think we just came here to talk and go. Of no, course. in our different endeavors, we are making efforts. Sure. And we will continue to make efforts. And our children will be happier for it. Sure. But we are not doing it for them mm -hmm. alone. We are doing it for, for us sure. too. Sure. We will be beneficiaries of the better Nigeria that yeah. we all are advocating for and working for. 
Sure. So that uh, when we have an offer on the table to sell, we will say, no, we're not selling. <laughs> well, so we I, are rebuilding. If I just answer uh, Mr. Francis, he opened by saying that he's surprised why being a lawyer, I'm also interested in the buying and selling of Nigeria. Well, I'm from Anambra State, <laughs> and I'm happy to say that from the part of the country where I come from, buying and selling is not It's a mistake. <laughs> so... Um, while we continue to push for the best options for Nigeria and Nigerians, please don't stop in your efforts to make Nigeria a better place. Don't forget, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to PlusTVAfrica.com forward slash The Advocates NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Join us next week, same time on this station, and let's keep advocating for a better society. Bye. Bye. <laughs> five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking, it's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.